Hello, and welcome to the January 6th Final Report, a reading. I am your host and narrator, Robert Keniston. This is Episode 5. In this episode, we continue the executive summary with an overview of the evidence developed. Next week's episode will continue this overview. So without further ado, let's begin. Executive Summary Overview of the Evidence Developed In the committee's hearings, we presented evidence of what ultimately became a multi-part plan to overturn the 2020 presidential election. That evidence had led to an overriding and straightforward conclusion. The central cause of January 6th was one man, former President Donald Trump, whom many others followed. None of the events of January 6th would have happened without him. The Big Lie In the weeks before Election Day 2020, Donald Trump's campaign experts, including his campaign manager Bill Steffian, advised him that the election results would not be fully known on election night. This was because certain states would not begin to count absentee and other mail-in votes until Election Day or after Election Day polls have closed. Because Republican voters tend to vote in greater numbers on Election Day, and Democratic voters tend to vote in greater numbers in advance of Election Day, it was widely anticipated that Donald Trump could initially appear to have a lead, but that the continued counting of mail-in, absentee, and other votes beginning Election Night would erode and could overcome that perceived lead. Thus, as President Trump's campaign manager cautioned, Understanding the results of the 2020 election would be a lengthy process, and an initial appearance of a Trump lead could be a red mirage. This was not unique to the 2020 election. Similar scenarios have played out in prior elections as well. Prior to the 2020 election, Donald Trump's campaign manager, Bill Steffian, along with House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy, urged President Trump to embrace mail-in voting as potentially beneficial to the Trump campaign. Presidential advisor and son-in-law Jared Kushner recounted others giving Donald Trump the same advice. Mail-in ballots could be a good thing for us if we look at it correctly. Multiple states, including Florida, had successfully utilized mail-in voting in prior elections and in 2020. Trump White House Counselor Hope Hicks testified, I think he, President Trump, understood that a lot of people vote via absentee ballot in places like Florida and have for a long time and that it's worked fine. Donald Trump won in numerous states that allowed no excuse absentee voting in 2020, including Alaska, Florida, Idaho, Iowa, Kansas, Montana, North Carolina, North Dakota, Ohio, Oklahoma, South Dakota, and Wyoming. On election night 2020, the election returns were reported in almost exactly the way that Steffian and other Trump campaign experts predicted, with the counting of mail-in and absentee ballots gradually diminishing President Trump's perceived lead. As the evening progressed, President Trump called for his campaign team to discuss the results. Steffian and other campaign experts advised him that the results of the election would not be known for some time, and that he could not truthfully declare victory. It was far too early to be making any calls like that. Ballots, ballots were still being counted. Ballots were still going to be counted for days. Campaign senior advisor Jason Miller told the select committee that he argued against declaring victory at that time as well because it was too early to say one way or the other who had won. Stepien advised Trump to say that votes were still being counted, it's too early to tell, too early to call the race, but, you know, we are proud of the race we run. We ran and we, you know, think we're, think we're in a good position and would say more in the coming days. President Trump refused, and instead said this in his public remarks that evening. This is a fraud on the American public. This is an embarrassment to our country. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. 
we did win this election. We want all voting to stop. And on the morning of November 5th, he tweeted, stop the count. Halting the counting of votes at that point would have violated both state and federal laws. According to testimony received by the select committee, the only advisor present who supported President Trump's inclination to declare victory was Rudolph Giuliani, who appeared to be inebriated. President Trump's Attorney General, William Barr, who had earlier left the election night gathering, perceived the president's statement this way. Right out of the box on election night, the president claimed that there was major fraud underway. I mean, this happened, as far as I could tell, before there was actually any potential of looking at evidence. He claimed there was major fraud, and it seemed to be based on the dynamic that, at the end of the evening, a lot of Democratic votes came in, which changed the vote counts in certain states. And that seemed to be the basis for this broad claim that there was major fraud. And I didn't think much of that, because people had been talking for weeks, and everyone understood for weeks that that was going to be what happened on election night. President Trump's decision to declare victory falsely on election night and, unlawfully, to call for the vote counting to stop was not a spontaneous decision. It was premeditated. The committee has assembled a range of evidence of President Trump's pre-planning for false declaration of victory. This includes multiple written communications on October 31st and November 3rd, 2020, to the White House by Judicial Watch President Tom Fitton. This evidence demonstrates that Fitton was in direct contact with President Trump and understood that President Trump would falsely declare victory on election night and call for vote counting to stop. The evidence also includes an audio recording of President Trump's advisor, Steve Bannon, who said this on October 31st, 2020, to a group of his associates from China. And what Trump's going to do is just declare victory, right? He's going to declare victory. But that doesn't mean he's a winner. He's just going to say he's a winner. The Democrats, more of our people vote early that count. There's votes in mail, and so they're going to have a natural disadvantage. And Trump's going to take advantage of that. That's our strategy. He's going to declare himself a winner. So when you wake up Wednesday morning, it's going to be a firestorm. Also, if Trump, if Trump is losing by 10 or 11 o'clock at night, it's going to get even crazier. No, because he's going to sit right there and say, they stole it. I'm directing the Attorney General to shut down all ballot places in all 50 states. It's going to be, no, he's not going out easy. If Trump, if Biden's winning, Trump is going to do some crazy shit. Also, in advance of the election, Roger Stone, another outside advisor to President Trump, made this statement. I really do suspect it will still be up in the air. When that happens, the key thing to do is to claim victory. Possession is nine-tenths of the law. No, we won. Fuck you. Sorry. Over. We won. You're wrong. Fuck you. On election day, Vice President Pence's staff, including his chief of staff and counsel, became concerned that President Trump might falsely claim victory that evening. The vice president's counsel, Greg Jacob, testified that they're concerned that the vice president might be asked improperly to echo such a false statement. Jacob drafted a memorandum with this specific recommendation. It is essential that the vice president not be perceived by the public as having decided questions concerning disputed electoral votes prior to the full development of all relevant facts. Millions of Americans believe that President Trump was telling the truth on election night that President Trump actually had proof that the election was stolen and that the ongoing counting of votes was an act of fraud. As votes were being counted in the days after the election, President Trump's senior campaign advisors informed him that his chances of success were almost zero. Former Trump campaign manager Bill Steffian testified that he had come to this conclusion by November 7th and told President Trump. Committee staff. What was your view on the state of the election at that point? Stephian? You know, very, very, very bleak. You know, I, we told him, the group that went over there outlined, you know, my belief and chances for success at this point. And then we pegged that at, you know, five, 
maybe 10% based on recounts that were that you know either were automatically initiated or could be could be initiated based on you know realistic legal challenges not all the legal challenges that eventually were pursued but you know it was you know my belief that it was a very very 5 to 10% is not a very good optimistic outlook Trump campaign senior advisor Jason Miller testified to the committee about this exchange Miller I was in the Oval Office, and at some point in the conversation, Matt Askowski, who was the lead data person, was brought on, and I remember he delivered the president in pretty blunt terms that he was going to lose. Committee staff. And that was based, Mr. Miller, on Matt and the data team's assessment of this sort of county-by-county, state-by-state results as reported. Miller. Correct. In one of the select committee's hearings, former Fox News political editor Chris Stilewalt was asked what the chance President Trump had of winning the election after November 7th, when the votes were tallied and every news organization had called the race for now President Biden. His response? None. As the committee's hearings demonstrated, President Trump made a series of statements to White House staff and others during this time period indicating his understanding that he had lost. President Trump also took consequential actions reflecting his understanding that he would be leaving office on January 20th. For example, President Trump personally signed a memorandum and order instructing his Department of Defense to withdraw all military forces from Somalia by December 31st, 2020, and from Afghanistan by January 15, 2021. General Keith Kellogg, retired, who had been appointed by President Trump as Chief of Staff for National Security Council, and was Vice President Pence's National Security Advisor on January 6th, told the Select Committee that an immediate departure that that memo said would have been catastrophic. It's the same thing what President Biden went through. It would have been a debacle. In the weeks that followed the election, President Trump's campaign experts and his senior Justice Department officials were informing him and others in the White House that there was no genuine evidence of fraud sufficient to change the results of the election. For example, former Attorney General Barr testified, and I repeatedly told the president in no uncertain terms that I did not see evidence of fraud. You know, that would have affected the outcome of the election. And frankly, a year and a half later, I haven't seen anything to change my mind on that. Former Trump campaign lawyer Alex Cannon who was asked to oversee incoming information about voter fraud and set up a voter fraud tip line, told the select committee about the pertinent call with White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows in November 2020. Cannon, so I remember a call with Mr. Meadows where Mr. Meadows was asking me what I was finding and if I was finding anything. And I remember sharing with him that there weren't finding anything that would be sufficient to change the results in any of the key states. Committee staff. When was that conversation? Cannon. Probably in November, mid to late November. Committee staff. And what was Mr. Meadows' reaction to that information? Cannon. I believe the words he used were, so there is no there there. President Trump's campaign manager, Bill Steffian, recalled that President Trump was being told wild allegations and that it was the campaign's job to track the allegations down. Committee staff, you said that you were very confident that you were telling the president the truth in your dealings with him. And had your team been able to verify any of these allegations of fraud, would you have reported those to the president? Steffian, sure. Committee staff, did you ever have to report that, Stefan? One of my frustrations would be that, you know, people would throw out, you know, these reports, these allegations, these things that they heard or, or saw in a state, and they tell President Trump. And, you know, it would be the campaign's job to track down the information, the facts. And, you know, President Trump, you know, if someone's saying, Hey, you know, all these votes aren't counted or were miscounted, you know. If you're down in a state like Arizona, you'd like to hear in that. It would be our job to track it down and come up dry because the allegations didn't prove to be true. 
and we'd have to, you know, relay the news that, yeah, that tip that someone told you about those votes or that fraud or, you know, nothing came of it. That would be our job as, you know, the truth telling squad. And, you know, not not a fun job to be, you know, much. It's an easier job to be telling the president about, you know, wild allegations. It's a harder job to be telling him on the back end that, yeah, that wasn't true. Committee staff, how did he react to those types of conversations where you told him that an allegation or another wasn't true? Stefan, he was, he had, usually he had pretty clear eyes. Like, he understood, you know? You know, we told him where we thought the race was, and I think he was pretty realistic with our viewpoint, in agreement with our viewpoint of kind of the forecast and the uphill climb we thought we had. Trump campaign senior advisor Jason Miller told the committee that he informed President Trump several times that, specific to election day fraud and irregularities, there were not enough to overturn the election. Vice President Pence has also said publicly that he told President Trump there was no basis to allege that the election was stolen. When a reporter recently asked, did you ever point blank say to the president that we lost this election? Pence responded that I did many times. Pence has also explained there was never evidence of widespread fraud. I don't believe fraud changed the outcome of the election, but the president and the campaign had every right to have those examined in court. But I told the president that once those legal challenges played out, he should simply accept the outcome of the election and move on. The general counsel of President Trump's campaign, Matthew Morgan, informed members of the White House staff and likely many others of the campaign's conclusion that none of the allegations of fraud and irregularities could be sufficient to change the outcome of the election. What was generally discussed on that topic was whether the fraud, maladministration, abuse, or irregularities, if aggregated and read most favorably to the campaign, would that be outcome determinative? And I think everyone's assessment in the room, at least amongst the staff, Mark Short, myself, and Greg Jacob, was that it was not sufficient to be outcome determinative. In a meeting on November 23rd, Barr told President Trump that the Justice Department was doing its duty by investigating every fraud allegation, if it's specific, credible, and could have affected the outcome, but that they're just not meritorious. They're not panning out. Barr then told the Associated Press on December 1st that the department had not seen fraud on a scale that could have affected a different outcome in the election. Next, he reiterated this point in a private meeting with the president both that afternoon and on December 14th, as well as in his final press conference as attorney general later that month. The Department of Homeland Security had reached a similar determination two weeks earlier. There is no evidence that any voting system deleted or lost votes, changed votes, or was in any way compromised. This podcast has been a production of 2008 Studios under a contract with SAG-AFTRA. The recordings herein are property of 2008 LLC. Any inquiries to collaborate or contact can be sent to info at 2008.com. That's info at 20-08.com. If you enjoyed what you just heard, please feel free to share this podcast. And, of course, please subscribe to be updated on future episodes.